I think my mouth was just going faster than my brain and that tends to happen often. And I have never successfully ripped back before. Hey, what's up fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and today I have a knitting podcast for you. In today's episode, I have one finished object three new casts on, and a couple of interesting yarny updates to share with you. It is April 1st today when I'm filming. Definitely mentioned this last year. It's not spring because of the weather. It's not spring because of the equinox. It's spring because there's kids outside playing basketball, and I love it. Love it so much. So if you hear any of that, I'm sorry, but we're not going to yuck their yum. So let's jump into it. So the first project I want to share with you is my finished object, and it is my Aniela hat, which I test knit for Alexandra of Vert and Rose. Now this hat is a two-color brioche design. If you do a good job weaving in your ends, it is pretty much fully reversible, which is amazing. But I think what sets this brioche hat apart from other brioche or two color brioche accessories is that it is designed to be worked up with one strand of DK weight hand dyed yarn and a strand of alpaca boucle. Now I didn't use alpaca boucle or DK weight to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, my main color, which is my purple color, is Violet Opal from Grenouille Co's 2023 Bioluminescence Advent. I didn't get the Advent, but I did buy two skeins of this colorway when she did a pre-order for them in January. Love this colorway. It is a cool toned purple, but it pulls in some speckles of teal and green and brown. It might be a little hard to see the way this has been knit up, but I'll be sure to add in an image of the yarn there. And because it pulls in all of those, those earthier tones, like the greens and the browns, I thought that a green mohair or a green fluff would be a really nice complement to the purple violet opal skein. So my green colorway is Soubois from Sonder Yarn Co. I don't know that this is a colorway that they still carry, but they definitely have a good array of earthy greens across pretty much all of their bases. But what I did here was I held two strands of their Luna base, which is a lace weight BFL Massum or Masham, with two strands of their Halo base, which is their silk mohair. Uh, so four strands in total to get this green colorway um, fluffy and at a good, good enough gauge to kind of make the hat work. Uh, and I think the colorways work really, really nicely together. This was my first time working brioche, first time working two color brioche, and I really enjoyed it. I found it super rhythmic. I did have some trouble with the decreases, working them on Magic Loop. I don't know if it was because I was tired because the, the decreases themselves aren't objectively hard. Actually, I think my problem with the decreases was that, you know, I was holding a fingering weight double and then lace weights quadruple. So the decreases were just a little bit difficult in terms of making sure that my needle was catching every strand whenever I had to knit together uh, yarn overs and extra purl stitches and stuff like that. So it was a little bit fiddly. I would suggest as much as possible if it's your first time doing brioche to minimize the number of strands you're working with. Uh, just to make sure that it's rhythmic, it's clean, it's smooth, it's easy to, to work up. But you know, ultimately it was pretty successful. This is the right side of a hat, and I think you can see that one column of all of my decreases is definitely wonkier than the column beside it. I honestly can't remember if it's the left-leaning or the right-leaning decrease that that is like that I guess for for you it might be mirrored but for me this looks like it's the 
the right leaning decrease maybe that is is looking a little wonky but it's not too much of a problem because I'm typically going to be wearing the hat this way uh, just to minimize the amount of mohair that's against my forehead and my ears and with the brim flipped up it looks like this so you get the nice purple and the beautiful tubular cast on as the dominant color in the brim and then the green becomes the dominant color in the rest of the hat. Now putting this on, I did knit the hat to the exact measurements specified in the pattern and it does give a quite close fitting hat with a pretty significant brim. Now I do like a chunkier brim, but I would prefer having a little bit more space up here in the crown. And so I might suggest if you would prefer having more space at the top of your hats to knit an extra seven, five to seven, maybe even 10 centimeters. 10 might be a little dramatic, uh, but definitely knitting at least five maybe seven centimeters more than the pattern suggests, just to get that space at the top of the hat that looks a little more purposeful, I suppose, would be the word I'm looking for. But I think this is lovely. I think it's just, I think it's cute. I think the contrast is, you know, it's more contrast than I would typically go for, but I feel like this was a really, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Fortuitous? No. I think it's just a, a nice color combo, a really good color pairing. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Great knitting experience. Um, Alexandra was very responsive to everyone's feedback um, and it landed in the pattern. So just a great test knit. Um, this is what the very top of the crown looks like. So you do get this ring. Um, after your decreases because there's one row that's just done uh, just like straight up knit wise decreases without using any of the brioche technique uh, but you know who's really looking at the top of your head like that I don't think anybody is um, so yeah this was a great test knit I enjoyed knitting this hat so much so that I've already cast on a second one so I will share that with you now if you saw my last podcast episode, um, or I actually more importantly, if you didn't see the last podcast episode, I talked about the trip that my mom and I took to New York City a few weeks ago. Uh, we were really lucky to get an opportunity to go to Nitty City. I had so much fun there. And I shared a couple of the yarns that I picked up. I'll pop in a photo of the skein so you can see a little bit better. This yarn is from a dyer called Trellis or Trail Trellis. Trellis. Um, this is the label. Sorry for the crackling. It's the label. Uh, this base is an 85% superwash merino, 15% nylon. It looks to me like a three ply sock yarn. The base is called Aries. The colorway is called H2O. And it's this really, really delicate aqua with these fluorescent green, neon orange, um, and like highlighter yellow speckles all throughout it. I think it's such a fun and like refreshing colorway. I think it's very spring. And I thought that this would be a perfect color A for my hat. And then I'm pairing it with my leftover elderflower from my sibling sweater. So this is the Knitting for Olive Heavy Merino in like this really delicate, it's like a, it's off-white, really soft, soft yellow. Um, not quite like the butter yellow that's really on trend this year. But I think that this color pairing is really, I find it very delicate, um, very fresh and spring appropriate, quite low contrast compared to my first hat, but I think this is going to be absolutely gorgeous. I talk about when I, whenever I knit a hat, I'm like, this is going to go so great with this coat that I have. Um, so I think this will go quite nicely with my teal colored, like my, my like seafoam green lightweight cropped puffer coat but I think it'll also be a really nice like fresh contrast to my 
wool camel colored coat I think just like this on top will add some lightness and brightness to that overall look and so I don't have much I just cast on last night so I've got perhaps an inch of the hat so far um I do think that I'm interested to see how this fabric works up without having the fluff both my first test knit and this one, I am working up on 3.5 millimeter needles, but the pattern calls for four millimeter needles. I just know I tend to have a loose gauge. And I think so far this fabric is still working up, you know, neat and tidy, but I don't know if it's going to have that same plushness and loftiness as my version with mohair does. I do think I'll get more wear out of a hat without mohair, so it'll be fun to do a little bit of a comparison and contrast between the two hats once they're both done. But I'm not really in a hurry with this because I think we're quickly moving away from hat weather. That's fine. Um, this is just, like I said, a really rhythmic and, in my opinion, very enjoyable stitch to be knitting, especially as long as you're just doing a tube. It's a little bit more involved than stockinette. I wouldn't necessarily call it mindless, but it's still, I think, a very stimulating and enjoyable stitch to be working up. I did the tubular cast on again for this one. I've heard that you should go up a needle size for the very first step of your tubular cast on when you're just kind of slingshotting stitches onto the needle before you work the slip stitch and knit setup rows. I used, I think a six millimeter needle to do that like slingshotty part of the tubular cast on. And so when I started the setup rows, the last stitch ended up having a lot of extra yarn in it. And I don't know, I don't know how well it's gonna show up. Um, I don't know if when I weave in my my tail, if I can do anything about that, or if I can go in with like a finer needle tip and kind of stretch out some of the other cast on stitches to kind of eat up that extra yarn. But it looks a little sloppy to me right now. Um, I don't think it's gonna be, I think I can do something to tighten it up a little bit. I don't think it's worth unraveling and redoing the tubular cast on. I used to be more intimidated by tubular cast on, but you know, it's it's pretty intuitive to me now. So we'll definitely be using it again in the future. Maybe not like 200 stitches to cast on the body of a sweater, but definitely for hats and socks. I can see myself moving toward it, although I do love my German twisted cast on. I think that this works really well for a hat where you'll be able to see the brim. It's worth the time. So yeah, that's my second Aniela hat. This is now available for purchase. It was released, I think, less than a week after the test knit ended. So I definitely suggest that you check out Alexandra's patterns, especially this Aniela hat, because it's just, it's cute, it's cool. Depending on what kinds of colors you can do, you can really get a different flavor out of your hat. So. Um, I would love to know what kind of color combos you would go for for something like this. Next up, I have a half finished object in some really special yarn. So this is it. Um, doesn't really look like much when I show it to you like this, uh, but it is the Leeds Mitten. It's a Leeds Fingerless Mitten, uh, which is a free pattern by Svartafaret which is, I believe, like a Scandinavian yarn manufacturer. Um, it's a two by two ribbed fingerless mitt. I cast on with a German twisted cast on. I knit up, I did the thumb hole, and then I knit up a little bit more. Um, the pattern doesn't come in English. I think it only comes in Swedish. German and Danish, possibly. It doesn't come in English, but I just popped it into Google Translate. I do think that ChatGPT actually does a better job of translating knitting patterns into English. It uses 
um, a little bit more of the conventional terms as opposed to sometimes the translations are a little like like the translation is correct but it doesn't quite match the knitting vocabulary that we're we're used to for example the way it described um, slipping stitches around the thumb hole was kind of not peculiar just just different from from what you would expect from an English pattern uh, but it's pretty it's a pretty straightforward like it's just a tube of two by two ribbing with a hole that you knit flat for a little bit and then continue knitting in a tube of two by two ribbing i am knitting these uh for adam who is my partner they're just intended to be a pair of fingerless mittens for when we read outside and it's a little bit more brisk or if we're going for a walk or something like that um but I'm really pleased with how this one's turning out. It fits quite snug on, on my hand already, and Adam did try it on as I was working them up, especially to make sure that there was enough space in the thumb. And they fit him, of course, a little more snugly because his hands are quite large compared to mine, but they still fit him quite well. He says he likes that it, it does have that feeling of negative ease on his hands and his wrist, so... I just have the second one to work up. This took me, I've got these, these stitch markers in so I know when to split for the thumb. Um, I basically did all of this in, in three hours. So a relatively quick knit on three millimeter needles, a worsted weight gauge. So I mentioned that the yarn I used for this is quite special to me, and that is because it is one of the colorways that I co-developed with Angelica of Curio Fiber. So Angelica reached out to me and suggested that we co-collaborate or co-create a couple of yarn colorways together. So I sent her some inspo images from Pinterest and she came up with these two colorways. So the lighter of the two is called Moon Jelly and the darker one is called Seferina. And they definitely play into this kind of unified color story of like mysterious deep sea kind of creatures. But the moon jelly definitely skews a little more purple and periwinkle. It's softer, it's obviously a bit lighter. And I think that Safarina definitely brings a little bit more of that royal blue punch, pulls in a little bit more navy and a little bit more like of a graphite kind of gray tone at some times, whereas this definitely pulls in some purple and some periwinkle together. But I know that Angelica has marled these two colorways together and it looks fantastic. I have held the sport weight base double for this mitten to get a worsted weight and you know it's in the ribbing as well so I think that blends the colorway quite a bit which is really cool. Um, I, Adam did choose this one uh, for his mittens, so I think it'll suit him quite well also. But it was just really cool for me to, you know, I'm not, I'm not a dyer. I've never dyed yarn. I've never really dyed anything before, except like I tie dyed my lab coat and a few t-shirts in my days. But this was a really cool experience for me to see uh, kind of like my vision come to life on some yarn and Angelica was absolutely wonderful to work with and so I'm pretty sure she still got a handful of these available in her web shop. I will absolutely link Curio Fiber down below and if I'm not mistaken she also does bespoke or custom colorway orders so if you were interested in something very specific that you are looking for, you could definitely reach out to Angelica Curio Fiber and see if you can make that happen. Angelica did gift these two skeins to me, so it was really exciting to get to start working it up so soon. We do have plans to do a couple more collaborative colorways throughout the rest of 2024, so do stay tuned for that as well. My next work in progress is one that you've seen loads before, but we're actually making some strides on it now, which feels really, really good. And it is my sunshine tea test knit for Andrea Gone Knits. Now for quite a while, I was just working down the stockinette body of this, but I have since 
done my seamed hem here at the bottom and I have knit and seamed the collar. And honestly, I am starting to lose a little bit of steam on this, but I have exactly three weeks left in the test knit the day that I'm filming this. And now all I have left to do are my two sleeves. So we're gonna get it done, it's gonna be fine. Um, but I definitely underestimated how effortful a stockinette t-shirt was going to be. <laughs> now this pattern is, I think, going to be an absolute staple spring summer knit for a lot of knitters. It is a top down set in sleeve t-shirt with stockinette folded detailing at the collar, at the hem, and at the ends of the sleeves. I am working mine up in the Knitting for Olive Cotton Merino in the colorway Mole. Love this yarn. This is the first time I'm holding the Cotton Merino single. I've only ever worked it double before, and I am enjoying the fabric that it's starting to come up with. I am curious to see how it behaves once it's blocked and what its tendency to pill is going to be like because this is a 70% cotton and 30% merino wool blend, which is quite atypical. I think you typically see uh, more merino dominant blends or you see like a 55-45 or a 50-50 split of the wool and the cotton. So you definitely feel the cottony-ness of this yarn, but you also get the wooly tactile kind of sensation from it too. So it's an interesting fabric that's working up. It is a very smooth fabric, I think, that's working up. I mean, this isn't even blocked, and I think it looks pretty sweet right now. I am working this up on three millimeter needles using a 2.5 millimeter needle for the for the hem pieces essentially so that they're worked very neat and tidy. So it's it's coming along quite well. I am knitting the size I for myself, which is a size up from what the pattern suggests for me. But when I did my gauge swatch, which was worked flat, I was a little bit under. Um, I had one too many stitches in my gauge swatch and I was a little bit concerned that, um, especially once I was working in the round, my gauge would tighten up even more and that I would get something that was a little bit too small. So I sized up from the D to the E and I definitely have more positive E's in the body now than I was expecting, but that is okay. I will try it on for you in a moment but I want to talk about some of the detailing on this first. First thing is the bottom hem is, as I mentioned, stockinette that is folded over and then seamed. I have done this kind of seaming once before on my sand cardigan test knit for then knitwear, but that was an Aran weight. It was a really, really wooly wool. And I used the Isire Erin Tweed, which in the colorway black, which was really, really dark. It was very hard to see my stitches. And so I did do kind of a haphazard job on that seaming. But for this, you know, being a fingering weight especially, I wanted it to be super, super clean. So it was a little bit of a slog to do, but we did it. And I think it looks incredible. I can't say the same necessarily for my collar. Now this collar has worked in a pretty interesting way or a very new to me way. You knit the collar inside out and then when you fold it over and sew it down, you are sewing it down to the outside of the t-shirt, which was quite terrifying for me. And so, you know, looking at it on camera, and I think once it's on, it's not gonna be too much of a problem, but I did struggle with making sure I was seaming into the same row so that the collar ended up being the same thickness all throughout. So you can see right where I've started here, the collar is quite shallow. And then if I turn it to here, you know, the collar's 
like a half centimeter thicker. So something was happening where I just couldn't get my needle into the same row every single time. And that's because, you know, your fabric is folded over. So you're coming through the fabric like this way when you're seaming. It was kind of difficult to, to see what I was doing. That and I am a right-handed knitter, but I am a left-handed person. And so whenever I am seaming or I'm doing something that requires holding a tapestry needle, such as a tubular bind off or an Italian bind off, I have to do that all with my left hand. And I'm working from right to left as I'm doing this kind of seaming as well. And so I had to turn it upside down basically. So I was holding it like this as I was seaming so that I could use my right hand to kind of stabilize the fabric and still use my left hand to maneuver the needle. Otherwise, it was always, I had to follow. Otherwise, I was going the other direction, basically, and I needed my left hand to do both things, which obviously wasn't possible. So that was kind of that was kind of fiddly. I'm glad I just got it over with. To be honest, I contemplated podcasting without this sewn down, but I was like, I'm just going to sit down. I'm just going to do it. It's going to be fine. And it is fine. I think it's fine. I haven't tried to put this on over my head yet. So this is going to be a moment of truth. And we're going to see what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. That was not bad. That was not bad at all. Now this is definitely going to sit a little differently on my body right now just because I am wearing a shirt on underneath and so the fabrics are going to be interacting with each other as opposed to interacting with my skin. But that's okay. Let's see. So this is where we're at. I did knit the body in between the cropped length and the full length. Now in Andrea's initial images I think you can still see her her belly button between the hem of the shirt and the waistband of the pants that she's wearing. I didn't want my belly button to be exposed just because I hope to be able to wear this for work but I also don't want it to drift too far past where my high-waisted bottoms would sit against my waist and so this isn't blocked yet. We'll see what happens once it's blocked, but my belly button right now is is here. So my belly button is here. I am wearing some high-waisted leggings um, and a full-length top, but here's my belly button. So I am hoping that once this is blocked, it sits more right at the top of my hip bones. So I'm hoping for about an inch, maybe two inches of growth. Two inches sounds pretty Two inches sounds kind of dramatic, but at least an inch of growth, I think will be perfect for getting this just to sit like right around or a smidge past where my pants waistbands typically end so that, you know, I could do a subtle tuck if I wanted to, but yeah, that took a lot of, that took my breath out of me. I don't know why, but anyway, I think the fit is coming out quite good. If I check the ease on this, I'm definitely getting more positive ease right now than the pattern recommends. So could have been that my gauge swatch was too small and my knitting relaxed actually as I was working in the round. Um, it could be, you know, just that I, I sized up. It could be that cotton stretches more than wool. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think the fit is going to be okay. We're gonna see what happens once I've done the set-in sleeves. This is a good example of a shirt to be wearing this with because it is also a set-in sleeve. So once this is blocked, this will sit right at the, basically the apex of the shoulder where the collarbone comes to meet the top of the, the humerus um, or the top of like the upper arm bone essentially. So this looks like the fit is quite on track, but I do think that because this dips down a little bit further at the underarm, I am still going to have a little bit of positive ease around the sleeve and around the upper arm. I think it's going to be okay. I definitely prefer 
to have a little bit more positive ease in my knitted garments than less positive ease. But I am slightly concerned that because this is such a fine fabric, it might look a little rumply when my arms are kind of relaxed at my side and I just have like extra fabric sitting here. So we'll see. This is kind of the stage in a project where I'm always concerned about what the final fit is going to be like. I experienced the same thing with my, my sibling sweater, which ended up being a total home run. So I'm just, you know, as per usual, trying to trust the process. It should be okay. Uh, but I am really looking forward to having this finished. I think I should be able to get some pretty good wear out of it between April and May and possibly a little bit into June just because this does have more cotton content than merino but I do expect it'll be quite humid in the warmer months here so I want to get this done and get at least two months of wear out of it so hopefully this is done by the next time you see me sit down for a podcast episode. I have two sleeves with some short row shaping to do. Intimidating not very intimidating. I've done it before. It's just kind of one of those things that I procrastinate starting. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Got to get it started. Really should have done this before I started filming, but I am transferring onto some cords so that you can actually see what's going on here. The terror of transferring stitches from a big needle onto a barber cord is just unparalleled. Insert elevator music here we're almost there I did it so my final work in progress is also a recent cast on and it is a blouse number one by my favorite things knitwear so i'm going to tell you about the yarn first i've talked about the knitting loft and their yarns a few times before they have quite an extensive range of their own in-house yarn line now. They have a lot of interesting bases. They have a good mix of superwash and non-superwash bases, different animal fibers. I believe there's like a, I think they do alpaca surrey, like surrey silk now. They've got um, something that's kind of like a boucle, lots of different options. But their most recent base is this Cardi base. For some reason in the last episode when I shared this with you, I started talking about linen. Um, I think my mouth was just going faster than my brain and that tends to happen often. Um, oh well. <laughs> this is a 50% merino and 50% hemp base. So, you know, I think the yarn still has properties very similar to a merino linen blend, but it is hemp, not, not linen or, or flax. Um, and it's a DK weight yarn. So in one 100 gram skein, there's 238 meters or 260 yards. This colorway that I've chosen is called Apple Blossom. And it is a mix of this like taupey kind of peach color. And then there's some raspberry and there's some really soft yellowy, like almost chartreuse kind of green mixed in there. There's only one other variegated colorway currently that they're doing in this base. It's more of a gray blue that's called Summer Love. It's really, really lovely, but I think it was a little more cool toned than what works for me. And because this is a merino hemp blend, all of the other tonal colorways do a really good job of showing off those two different fibers in the yarn. So especially in the darker colorways, you can see that the hemp hasn't dyed as deeply or as saturated as the wool has. So you definitely get a lot more of that visual texture coming through in those darker colorways like the blues um, and like the espresso browns and things like that. But there are also a couple of lighter neutrals that are, you know, more of that undyed or cream look as well. So it's a gorgeous base. Um, it's a gorgeous base. And the Knitting Loft did gift me four skeins of this yarn. So I thought it was a good amount for a more close fitting spring slash summer evening type of garment. And I also don't know that I would want something like 
oversized in this or, or shawl-esque in this, but I thought something that was a little bit more um, feminine in its fit and its construction would, would work quite nicely. And so I did decide to go for blouse number one by My Favorite Things Knitwear. I did knit this uh, almost a year ago now, maybe eight months ago, in the cream colorway from Knitting for Olives Pure Silk. I used four millimeter needles to get gauge with that yarn. Pattern calls for five millimeter needles. With this yarn, I'm using four and a half millimeter needles. And I thought that, you know, I have mixed feelings about re-knitting patterns. On the one hand, I think that if it's something that you know you love to wear and you wear a lot, it makes sense to have have more of that because you've got proof of concept. Why wouldn't you love to wear this other one just as much? But I think if you're not careful with selecting your colorways or ensuring that there's something different enough about each of them, that sometimes you'll end up re-knitting something and then still favoring one over the other quite a lot more. Now that's different from, you know, you knit something one time and either your technique has improved or there's changes that you want to make to get the fit better or you're going to swap out one by one ribbing for two by two ribbing or like an I-cord edge or something like that. Um, I'm talking more about making like two equivalent things just in like different colors. So I waffled about that a little bit, but I ultimately decided that since I wear my cream one so much and that it's holding up really nicely, that there is space for a non-neutral version for when I'm feeling like playing into this like garden tea party vibe a little bit more, I suppose. And so I went for it. I am curious to see how the different fabrics behave or hold up over time. I think there's been a lot of folks who have been surprised or a lot of folks who are weary of using the pure silk for a project like this for fear of the yarn not holding up very well. And I was very concerned about knitting it up in the cream colorway when I was working on it last summer, but it has held up so well. I give it a steam after every handful of wears just because I don't want to be wet washing silk too often. Um, but the steaming is definitely really good, especially for the underarms, just to kill off whatever kind of bacteria might be present, but the cream color is holding up really nicely. The fabric isn't pilling too extensively. The shape has held quite well, which is, I think because the yarn is held double, that pure silk held single, I think that yarn does tend to get a little wonky um, and can pill a little bit more, but so far so good. But I am curious to see how this one behaves, if it behaves differently with the hemp and the wool. I am expecting it to still have like the right drape. The swatch that I knit was on four millimeter needles and it was still quite drapey. And now I'm working on four and a half millimeter needles. And I would then reasonably expect more drape from a looser gauge. So, so far so good. The colorway is gorgeous once it's knit up. I am alternating my skeins and I'm using the yarn forward method. So essentially I knit my short rows with one yarn and then once I started working in the round, I am alternating skeins every single round. Um, and using the yarn forward method, you basically bring your yarn to the front of the work as if to purl, then you drop it and then you just pick up the next yarn from the back of the work and knit across. Um, and basically just keep switching them off that way. Now it is recommended that you give your yarn a little bit of a tug when you switch it over. And I think you can see that I got this column, I have this column of tighter stitches. You can see where the fabric is folding. Um, this column of stitches that are a little bit more snug for a while. I did make an effort to try to not do that as snug going forward, but I do have that column there. I think it will probably 
block out and if it doesn't block out that great I mean it's at the center of the back so that's not too terrible of a place for it to be I'm not not that mad about it I did make a modification to my short rows one thing that I noticed about my cream version of the blouse number one is that the front neck can still ride up a little bit and so this sort of shoulder seam rather than sitting right on the top of my shoulder kind of falls backward a bit so I decided just to add in one extra short row. The short rows are worked across these increases that you start with initially for the shoulder. So by adding the one extra short row, I just took those increases away from the next or the subsequent section where you're just working increases in the round before you start shaping this triangular, this triangular shoulder cap. So my hope is that that extra short row does improve the fit a little bit more. I do still really enjoy the fit of this blouse. It's more of a boat neck shape and I enjoy it because it kind of opens up the chest in a way that I find is quite pretty and, and reads really elegant. So hopefully, you know, I still get the same fit effect, but it feels a little bit more comfortable on my body. So something that I talked about when I first knit this pattern is that the way stitch counts are recorded in this pattern um, is not the most helpful. So you start the pattern, obviously you're told how many stitches to cast on, then you do a little bit of work, and then you start shaping this triangular shoulder cap or sleeve cap. And at a certain point, the pattern says you should have this many stitches for your sleeve. And then never again does it tell you how many stitches you should have for your sleeve. It just tells you this is how many stitches you should have around your whole circumference, including both sleeves, the front and the back. Now, that's not that much of a problem. It's just not very handholdy and means that you need to double check your math with a calculator because I took a look at the number of rows I needed to work increases on and then I looked at the number of stitches I was increasing for each sleeve on each of those rows and I was like okay so I have this many stitches plus this many stitches equals that many stitches and I went on and I kept working those increase rounds until I reached that number of stitches. Now I can't say the exact numbers because it's in the pattern which is a paid for pattern um, but Basically, I can't do basic arithmetic without a calculator, um, or not that I can't, I just, I did that math and I was like, yup, that's it, and I proceeded and that wasn't it, so I ended up knitting my yoke 10 rows too long, which meant that I had to rip back, and I have never successfully ripped back before. So it was a very tense two hours where I had a 2.5 millimeter needle and I was like, I was picking up each right leg of all of my stitches and I attached to the end of my 2.5 millimeter needle, uh, my barber cord. So I was, was picking up all of the stitches section by section. It wasn't too difficult until I got to the where the increases are located because then I got kind of confused about what I should be picking up. I did try to take care to pick up in a knit row so that I wasn't um, causing any problems with like not catching uh, an increase or catching an increase when I wasn't supposed to. So I did all of that, took a deep breath, took out my needle and started unraveling and I did mess up. Um, I did go into the wrong row a good handful of times, but I was able to, you know, use extra needles to catch everything in the end and it all worked out okay. And so I was really excited because I thought I would be working on the body by now, but I have to go back and finish my yoke still. But it is coming along and I was honestly a little bit concerned about this colorway turning out a little too fleshy uh, and then making me look 
kind of I don't know just looking too fleshy and making me look washed out but I think that with this kind of like terracotta-y slightly peachy looking makeup it's gonna look quite lovely. Now the colorway is a little bit more um like traditionally feminine and pretty than what I typically choose for myself and I was anticipating that and so I will definitely show you know once this is closer to being done or once it is actually done I'll definitely show you ways that I would personally style it but because it is leaning a little bit more feminine in both its color and its shaping and its construction when I do style this I am planning to lean into a little bit more of you know like my more casual my more oversized and contemporary kind of vibe so I just wanted to show you like something I would pair something like this with are these I don't know if it's going to show you that well these like cargo they're just like cargo athletic pants that I got from the Gap they're a wide leg and they cinch you can cinch them at the at the ankle or just leave them as is either way works um, but I thought that you know the neutral color of this works quite well with the sort of warmer tones in the yarn and so this is not probably giving you that much information right now but you know if there's a colorway that calls to you but you don't feel like it completely reflects your personal style but it's still something that you're really interested in want to try out um, I think one way to experiment with styling and it's like you know if this is pretty and pink and feminine that doesn't mean that the whole outfit needs to be pretty and pink and feminine it's I think a good idea to try to mix in some contrast or some old reliables that you once again have like good proof of concept for to see if you can make it work in that way. Now to knit this yoke so far I have used I think about a hundred grams of yarn um, probably actually a little bit more than a hundred grams of yarn and so I'm wondering if there's a chance that I might be playing yarn chicken with this in the end. So I'm going to do a couple of things to help me out with this. One thing is that I'm going to also add some waist shaping to the body of this garment. So my plan is to decrease out about four to six stitches most likely four stitches um, at two points on either side of the torso, knit with that circumference and then increase those back out to give a little bit of that kind of shape to the garment because I think my cream version does that anyway, even though there aren't any decreases in the body. So that might just kind of emphasize the shape a little bit more, but also then I'm knitting four less stitches on every round for a good handful of rounds so that might conserve you know a marginal amount of yarn but some yarn for me and then I might consider also doing a few extra increases in the sleeves but I'm not sure yet I'm not sure yet what's more important to me with this if it's more important for me to have a full-length body or if it's more important to me to have fuller length sleeves because I think when you're going for something that is bracelet length or wrist bone length there's a fine line between that bracelet or that wrist bone length and the sleeve just looking too short so that's what I want to avoid but I also don't want my belly to be exposed while I'm wearing this I do want this to be you know more of a full length to like waist length kind of garment as opposed to a cropped garment so I'm gonna have to see once I'm actually done the yoke how much yarn I have used up I do still want to continue as much as possible to alternate skeins especially for the sleeves because the circumference will be different and so the color pooling in each skein of yarn will behave differently as well um, and so I wouldn't want there to be like a huge color pool right here 
where it's super obvious that I've just transitioned skeins and all of that. So that is my my blouse number one by My Favorite Things Knitwear. Uh, I'm I'm more excited about this than I expected to be, to be honest. Uh, my hope is that it'll still be cool enough in May that this could be a really nice thing to wear to Knit City. But also Knit City is not for another month and a half, so it's very possible that I will pick something else to cast on and knit in full before then, so we'll see. So folks, that's everything I wanted to share with you today. I hope you enjoyed getting to see what's currently on my needles and some of the spring colors that I am indulging in. If you're interested, I definitely encourage you to go back and take a look at my free knitting patterns for spring video, as well as my knitting my spring Pinterest boards. Um, those are both really fun ones that I had a lot of fun making. So you could definitely check those out. And what you can expect from me coming soon is an updated pattern roundup for sleeveless tops. I'm aiming for bra friendly, size inclusive, um, just kind of as an update to the one I put out. Ooh, might have been in 2022, not 2023. So yeah, we're definitely due for an updated sleeveless top pattern roundup. And I am also considering doing a roundup of my favorite yarns for spring and summer knitting. Even though I haven't knit with every plant-based yarn or every like cotton blend or linen blend or whatever, I have worked with quite a good number of them now over the years. And I'll also give some honorable mentions to ones that I'm interested in working with but haven't worked with. But I think that might be a good little resource to put in your back pockets while you're considering what you want to knit up for the spring and the summer. So let me know if that's a video that you would be interested in seeing and if you have any specific yarns that you would like for me to mention. Once again, thank you for hanging out with me today and until I get to see you all again, I am wishing you wellness and happy knitting. Bye everyone.